there's something called the Kardashev scale. It's a method of measuring civilization's level of technological advancement based on the amount of energy it's able to use. So type one civilization, and this might yeah. be given all your work is not no longer a scale that makes quite makes sense, but it very much focuses on the source of fusion, natural source of fusion, which is for us, the sun. And type one civilizations are able to leverage, uh, sort of collect all the energy that hits earth. Yeah. And then uh, type two civilizations are the ones that are able to leverage the entirety of the energy that comes from the sun by maybe building something. Like that, a Dyson sphere. Dyson sphere. Yeah, yeah. So when will we reach type one status? Is get to the level which we're, I think, maybe a few orders of magnitude away from currently. And in general, do you think about this kind of stuff? Is where energy is so fundamental to yeah. the like of life on Earth, but also the expansion of life into the universe. Oh, oh yeah. So one one of the fun, you know, on the on a weekend, one I I, I sat down and figured out what would it mean for interstellar travel, like to have a, a DT fusion. In fact, one of the I talked about my design class. One of my design classes was how you use um, a, a essentially a, a special configuration of a fusion device for not only traveling to, but colonizing Mars. Mm -hmm. So, because what would, it, what would it, you talk about energy use being at the heart of civilization? It's like, so what if you want to go to Mars not to just visit it, but actually like leave people there and make it something happen? Mm -hmm. It needs massive amounts of energy. So what would that look like? And it, it actually transforms what, what, how you're thinking about doing that as well too. Oh yeah, so we we do all those kinds of fun. And actually, it was it was a fairly you know quasi realistic actually. So do, do you think it'll be nuclear fusion that powers the civilization on Mars? Well, what we considered was something. So it turns out that there's thorium, which is a heavy element. It's, it, so it's a so-called fertile element. That we know, what, we we still know fairly little about the the, the geology of Mars and in, in, in a deep sense, and we know that there's a lot of this on the surface of Mars. So one of the things we considered was what would happen that it's basically a combination of a fusion device that actually makes fuel from the thorium. Oh. But the under but the underlying energy one was was fission itself as well too. So this is, this is one of the examples of being trying to be clever, right around those things. Or what is it? You know, this also means is like in, interstellar travel. It's like oh yeah, that looks almost like impossible basically from an energy balance point of view. It's just because like the energy required to that you have to transport to get there. Almost the only things that would work are DT fusion and basically um, annihilation. It's like Star Trek, right? <laughs> That's so what it is. Yeah. your sense is that interstellar travel will require fusion power. Oh, it's it's almost even impossible with fusion power. Actually, it's so hard. It's so hard because you have to carry the fuel with you, and the rocket equation tells you about how much fuel you you use mm -hmm. to take. So what you end up with is like how long does it take to go to these places, and it's like staggering you know periods of time so i i tend to believe that there's alien civilizations dispersed all throughout yeah but we might be totally isolated from them so you think we're not there's none in this galaxy so like and i guess and the it, question i also have is what kind of do you think they have nuclear fusion it's like is it all <laughs> yeah, is the yeah. physics all the same yeah oh the physics is all the same yeah right so this is the and this is the fermi paradox like where where the hell is everybody in the universe right um, well, there's some so you know the, the scariest one of those is that I would point out that there's been you know there's you know order of many tens of millions of species on the planet Earth, and only one ever got to the point of sophisticated tool use that we could actually start essentially leveraging the power of what what's in nature to our own will. Does this mean that basically this means so almost look there is almost certainly life or DNA equivalents or whatever would be somewhere. I mean, just because you just need a soup and you need energy and you get organics and whatever the equivalent of amino acids are. And, but, you know, most of the life on earth has been that those are still amazing, but it's still like, it's, it's not very interesting. Are we, are we actually the accident of history? This is a very interesting a one. Super, like, super yeah, rare. Accident. Super rare. And then, of course, the other part is that also just the other scary part of it, which if you look at the Fermi paradox, is good. Good, we got to this point. How long has it been in humans? So humans, Homo sapien, has been around for whatever hundred thousand years, two hundred thousand years, something. Like that. Um, 
our ability in, in that timeline to actually make an imprint on the universe like for by emitting radio waves or by modifying you know nature in a significant way has only been for about a hundred of those hundred thousand years and you know are we it's a good question so is it by definition that by the fact that when you are able to reach that a level of being able to mani manipulate nature and for, ex for example discover f f you know discover like fission or 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 other or 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 burning fossil fuels and all this is that what it says oh you're doomed because by definition any species that gets to that point that can modify their environment like, like that they'll actually push themselves you know past that's that's one of the most depressing scenarios that i can imagine yeah so the, the so basically we're we'll, we will never line up in time because you get this little teeny window in time where yeah. civilization might occur and you you can never see it because you never th these these sort of like scatter like like fireflies around the galaxy and you never yeah it yeah. goes up is up is up is up and then explodes destroys itself because of the or exponential it, 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 and when we say destroy ourselves all we'd have to do is that we basically go if if you Humans are all left, and we're still living on the planet. And yeah. but all we have to do is go to the technology of like you know eighteen hundred, yeah. and we're invisible in the universe again. Yeah. So it was when I when I listened to the I I thought I wanted to talk about this as well too because it's <laughs> it comes from well it comes from a science point of view actually yeah. of what it means, but also to me it's like a, another compelling driver of telling us it's like why we should try really hard not to screw this up. Like we're we're in this unique place of our ability to discover and to make it, and I just don't want to give up about thinking that we can get through. Yeah, I, I tend to see that there is some kind of game theoretic force, like with the mutually assured destruction, that ultimately in each human being there's a desire to survive and uh, a willingness to cooperate, yeah. to have compassion for each other in order to survive. Yeah. And I think that, I mean, maybe not in in humans. But I can imagine a nearly infinite number of species in which that overpowers any uh, technological advancement that can destroy yeah. or, or rewind the species. So I think if humans fail, I hope they don't. I see a lot of evidence for them not, but it seems like somebody will survive. And there you start to ask questions about why, why we haven't met yet. Maybe it's just space is large. Oh, space is, it's... I, I think in logarithms, and I can't even f fathom, you know, space. This is extraordinary, right? Yeah. It's extraordinarily large, yeah. I mean, there's so many places on Earth. I just recently visited Paris for the first time. Yeah. And there's so many other places I haven't visited There's yet. so many other places. Well, I, I like to, you know, it's interesting that we have this fascination with alien life. We have what is essentially alien life on earth already. Like yeah. you think about the organisms that develop around deep sea like thermal vents. One of my favorite books of all time from Stephen Jay Gould. If you've never read that book, it kind of blows your mind. It's, it's about the Cambrian explosion mm -hmm. of life. And it's like, oh, you look at these things and it's like, are the chance of us existing as a species, like the, the, the genetic diversity was larger back then. Mm -hmm. You know, this is about five, about 500 million years ago or something like that. It is a mind altering trip <laughs> of thinking about our place in the universe, I have to say. Plus the mind itself yeah. is a kind of alien with almost, um, almost a mystery to ourselves. We still don't understand it. The very, the very mechanism that helps us explore the world is still a mystery. Yeah. So that, like understanding that will also unlock, um, quite quite possibly unlock our ability to understand the world uh, and maybe build machines that help us understand the world, build tools that help yeah. us understand. Yeah, I mean, it already has. I mean, our ability to understand the world is is ridiculous almost, actually. <laughs> <laughs> and, and post about it on TikTok. It's, it's almost unbelievable like where, where we've gotten all this to.